Hello, and welcome to the Will Leach Show. I am the aforementioned Will Leach, and I thank you for spending part of your day with me. Today's show is about sports getting away with it. About 10 years ago, I was in the clubhouse at Yankee Stadium waiting to interview a, an athlete by his locker with another Yankee who will remain nameless, decided to have a little fun with me. He pointed to his locker and he had one of those calendars that you see in like mechanic shops, the one where like a woman is in a bikini and holding like a socket wrench. The player, seeing me looking young and nervous and wearing like a dorky tie, nudged me and said, nice tits, right? He was trying to embarrass me and it worked, but even better than he thought it did because standing right next to me was a prominent female television reporter. She looked at me and then him, then me and then him, and he grinned. That could be you under your jacket there, he said to her. I would like to say that I told him off, but I didn't. I just pretended to laugh and I walked away. I saw the female reporter later and apologized and she just shrugged. Don't worry about it. I'm used to it. It happens all the time. Ten years later, I'd like to think that it happens less, but the truth is that I just don't know. The Me Too movement has fundamentally altered the worlds of publishing, finance, entertainment, and even fine dining. But save for a couple of creeps at the NFL network, it really hasn't touched sports much, has it? This seems odd considering, well, sports has a ton of guys. They're everywhere. They're operating the lights right now. They're talking in my earpiece right now. They're speaking to the camera this very second. The last year has confirmed that whenever an industry has men in positions of power, which is to say all of them, they are rife with abuses of that power. But somehow the four major North American professional sports, all of which are run by men, feature only male players, and have more than 90% of the executives of men, have been mostly untouched by the Me Too movement. So what's going on? Some would argue it's because of the nature of sports. Sports is a place where men can be men, where aggression is rewarded, where being the alpha male wins you championships. You hear this a lot, actually. The locker room is not your normal workspace. Except it is, actually. It's in America, right? People do get paid for being there, right? Guess what? Normal workspace. People in sports are always using military metaphors for their jobs, but the military has far more stringent workplace harassment policies and accepted widely known venues on how to report violations than anything in sports. If someone can't use the, I'm fighting and dying for my country so I can act like a toxic asshole as an excuse, your ability to bunt the runner over to third ain't gonna cut it either. But this is still the culture in sports, and the proof is in the total silence surrounding this issue. I've never met a single woman who works in sports who hasn't had to deal with this in one way or the other every single day, anytime they do anything, and I'm sure they don't even tell me close to the worst stuff. The world of sports is as bad as any industry when it comes to abuses by men in power, and probably worse. That more stories haven't come out isn't a refutation of that fact. It's proof that it's probably worse than I, or any of us, ever thought. Our guest today is a host for Sportsnet New York and CBS Sports Network, also the host of the Taylor Rooks of the Time Out with Taylor Rooks podcast, and most important to me, anyway, a fellow University of Illinois alum. Please welcome Taylor Rooks. <laughs> Taylor, thank you very Hi. much for coming on. Please, please, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming on our fake talk show. I appreciate it. Happy uh, to be here. Thank you. I think you're very honored. <laughs> so, okay, so the theme of this, we do a theme for every show. And, uh, and one of the th themes that I, I kind of talked about in my opening monologue, I, I, we're light, it's just, oh, but this is a serious thing, and I want to kind of get down. I'm curious, it strikes me as, frankly, absurd, as someone that's worked in the industry for 20 years, that of, you look at all the different industries that have been upended by the Me Too movement of the last, of the last year. And I had a friend of mine say, wow, I had no idea that NPR was run by such pigs. I'm like, well, <laughs> everything is run by pigs, but NPR is just better at reporting itself out than some other industries. And so it seems surprising to me that sports, of all things, generally has been kind of quiet. There's been a couple things here or there, but it's definitely not been shaken up as much. And, and I think there's something inherent to the culture of, that, uh, of sports. And I'm curious, you know, you, uh, you have had this meteoric rise. Uh, if, uh, actually, meteors fall. I don't know why they say meteoric rise. You've <laughs> yeah, had, it is the opposite. Yeah, you've had a yeah. missile rise uh, <laughs> through the industry. I'm like, hope no one ever says, well, he had a meteoric fall. He fell to earth because his career fell apart. Uh, I'm curious, like, not only, you know, one of the, I've, I've always kind of admired how, like, you've talked about, like, some of the women that you've admired that, admire that have worked in the industry. I'm sure they've had stories of what they've gone through. And I'm curious, why do you think, from your time doing this, I, it seems very odd to me that this is still so quiet about this. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on it. 
you know, it's strange because I think in some ways in sports journalism, your survival almost depends on not just fitting in with the guys, but also kind of being one of the guys. Whereas I think in a lot of the other industries, it's not necessarily reliant on those things. You know, you're always having to talk to athletes right. or talk to men in higher positions. And if you kind of burn that bridge, everything is done because you're not surrounded by women in a sense. You almost have yeah. the cushion of women in other industries. Um, but I do think it's amazing, you know, we're seeing with, you know, Richardson and the Panthers, how right. that's over, yeah. those allegations and, and, see, are, and that was over like that, yes, like he was exactly. gone like immediately. Right? Yeah, because we're, I think also with this movement, we're seeing this shift of, you know, people questioning the women's credibility and shifting to why are men like this? Right, right. And it wasn't like that originally. But I do agree it is weird that it hasn't necessarily hit the sports world in the same way because it's all men. I mean, just probability yeah. of the yeah. men doing something oh, I mean, like, that, yeah. it like is, is extremely me, high. Never mind just the culture, just the math. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it, the math it, it, of it its own thing. I yeah. mean, I remember I wrote a piece about this a few years ago about how um, when uh, – after, remember after O.J. Simpson's uh, domestic violence arrest, he was on Letterman. It was like that was a publicized thing. Like, like it was in the papers. He was on Letterman like a month afterwards, and not only was he not asked about it, but now I'd like they would he would just be there's a, there's a domestic violence. Like I wonder if that's something that that that's the way that that the industry has like domestic violence is the thing they've gotten serious about now in a way that they frankly weren't always. And I think yeah. as you can have evidence of that. But I'm curious. That still feels like. Oh well, congratulations! Mm -hmm. Like you've gotten tough on literally one of the worst things a yeah, human being can do. Yeah, something that's easy to get yeah. tough on. Yeah, and, and, and I'm and I'm curious. I wonder if a part of it is the journalism too, and that the idea that like that doesn't strike me. And you know, you work in media that it doesn't strike me that sports departments, the way that news departments or feature departments are like look at the New York Times like look at the YNC stuff that those were incredible reporters all put exactly on that story and I don't know if the sports media culture is set up to like no one's going to their sports desk and saying okay guys we're not covering the Knicks road trip mm -hmm. though that might actually be a good idea <laughs> uh, they're not covering the Knicks road trip we're gonna go ferret out this story about this this this, this that the other I wonder if that's it but I feel like that actually isn't just me that's actually fans right I'm curious and particularly in your part of the industry, anytime that you do anything, because you're a woman, anytime you do anything, whether you say anything, whether like literally anything, if you put up a picture, here's a picture of me and a stuffed animal. Yeah. The most innocuous, happy thing in the world, the things you get response on that. Do you have to, do you feel like already steeled to that? Is there a, how do you balance the kind of having a tough hide on that yeah. while also being a human being? Well, I'm definitely a big believer in like not reading your comments for that exact Wise. reason. Wow. But yeah. I always tell people one of the reasons I decided to do a podcast and not necessarily have a full video component is because I wanted people to have to focus on just listening to right, me. Right. I didn't want it to be about seeing this video and commenting on what I look like or the dress right. I'm wearing and all this stuff that has nothing to do right. with the interview. Because that is what would happen. But I felt like, okay, if you're having to hear me tell this story and interview this person, you have no other choice but to comment on the actual work. And I have almost, it's empowering me in a sense as well to say you know what I'm not just here because this is how I look or how I dress I'm here because I, I put out a good product and I produce a good product but I think that in a lot of ways like you have to not necessarily prove that to yourself but you feel like you're having to prove it to everyone else um, just because there is such this inherent I guess want to look at you as a woman first and a journalist second and you're like well how can I switch that narrative and it has to be with with your work, even though I truly don't think it's your responsibility to have to change the minds of other people. Right, right. It certainly makes your life easier right, if right. their mind is changed. One of the things I've enjoyed, I guess I, I remember when you were in, I, I mean, you, I, with you, you're in Illinois. Yes, I said, ILL. You, I and I, and <laughs> damn, damn, damn. And, uh, but we, uh, I remember tracking, you were like breaking stories uh, in Champaign. I was at the Daily Line I, when I when I was in school and broke Nothing but like, <laughs> like bongs. Frank bongs are like the only thing that I broke <laughs> at the University of Illinois. What and was so, your go-to bar? Uh, I see. I wasn't a frat person. Okay. So I went to like like Murphy's gotcha. and like places. Yeah, I wasn't. So I didn't do the camps thing. I gotcha. Was, I, I would have gotten nothing. I like. But, I lived at camps. I know. I would have gotten so many wedgies at camps. <laughs> I was not allowed at camps. I was way too. Uh, to, anyway, I was way too dorky. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious, one of the things, I've, I've followed your career for a long time, and one of the things that's been fun to kind of watch, particularly since you've gotten to New York, and you really kind of, because you were at Big Ten Network, and, and I, you're here, you've done more commentary, which I, has, I, I have to say has been actually kind of a really exciting thing, not just because I think you're good at it, though you are, but also like, 
commentary is usually like, like frankly, commentary is usually a bunch of old white guys like me yelling hot takes at each other. And so to see like your, your, you, the, to see them, not only you being good at it, but for them recognizing, oh, like she's really good at this and we kind of don't have this perspective and we really need it. Th that's gotta be a confidence thing too, right? Like, do you feel like, is that the ultimate, would you like to go in that direction uh, across the board or, or what, uh, what kind of inspired you to wanna do that? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the number one things that makes me feel fulfilled like in this arena is the fact that I don't have to hold back how I feel. Yeah. And I think in some ways it really is an advantage because you're right, I think about the things that have happened in sports and I wonder how they would have had the conversation if it was just four white guys at a table. Which is literally what it's been for yes. since forever. Yes, and in forever. some places it still is. Right. And when that happens, what you end up having is really four people telling you the same thing right. because it's four people that in some ways have had a very similar experience experience. You know, you think about Colin Kaepernick or you think about women's issues and you wonder, well, how can you have that discussion if there isn't somebody there that also reflects the issue? Um, and I think that it's kind of scary to think, well, how would they have talked about this if I wasn't there? Then that voice is missing. And it's going to be mm -hmm. discouraging too because I mean, I've seen your commentaries on this and I am t I think you are absolutely right about all of these things. Most of sports doesn't seem to disagree with doesn't seem to agree with this cuz Colin Kaepernick is still not in the NFL, yeah. and there are still none of these stories coming out of, out of sports. And, I, and for me, I, like my default spot is like, oh man, that's terrible. But I've got other stuff to worry about, and I'm, I'm working like like I, I I can note it, but because of who I am, and just like I'm I'm a 42 year old white dude, I'm like, yeah, that I feel really terrible for the people that, that affects. But but that is <laughs> I'm not one of them. So yeah. like I, I whereas and I'm curious how discouraging do you, does that discouraging or does that kind of like like kind of steal you more? I think it steals me more because okay. I truly feel as though I have a responsibility. I think about the people that are watching and I want them to feel like the way they feel and think about this issue is also being represented on television. Mm. I always think about just representation and how important it is to have somebody that looks like you talking about issues that matter to you. Because it's so easy to skew a narrative if you don't have one person that understands. And for a really long time, there was not one like person forever. that understood. <laughs> right, yes, yeah. and so it is definitely good to see that we are moving in a different direction. I think that there's a, still a ways to go, but we're headed there. And I don't want to get caught just on this topic because you also like you're now covering New York sports yes. uh, coming from mm -hmm. but from uh, the, recently the Midwest and I did that as well I went to New York magazine and covered a bunch of New York sports and I found because I'm, I'm like fucking Midwestern guy I love sports <laughs> sports are fun and then I go and I meet I see all of like these New York reporters and they're all just like angry and they're yeah. all like and they're all <laughs> fired up and they all frankly kind of resemble the callers on their own shows a lot of the time i'm curious do you still uh do, do, a do you still like sports as much as you did <laughs> when you started doing your uh, started working in new york and two do you feel that like why are they so unhappy and why are they so angry? They yeah. probably seem pretty fun. You get to just talk about sports all the time. I mean, that's one thing I told myself is I don't want to come here and get jaded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of why New York journalists feel the way they feel. I think they're kind of just jaded But by are everything. they jaded by New York or are they jaded by the way that we talk? They people, like, it just feels like there's always something, like, when A-Rod was, A-Rod was gone before you got here mm -hmm. as a player, but like, a you just say A-Rod and people would just start yelling. They, like, yes. a guy would pop behind that desk and start screaming in my face. Everything's if I polarizing even, every, and, it's, and, that, yeah. and I wonder, is that specific to New York? Is that specific to New York media? And I feel like you're in it now. Like, mm -hmm. you're, you see that, well, I've seen some of the people that you're on the show with, perfectly nice human beings, mm -hmm. but definitely those kind of guys. And yeah. I'm curious, like, do you, do you, like, I, 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 you don't want to end up like them, but yeah. I guess you want to, they're, again, nice guys, but you still want to make sure that you like sports is probably the no, best No, definitely. Way to I think it is a, a combination of it being in New York and also New York media because here there's always something that happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it is never ending. So you're always having to stay up on what's next and you want to beat the guy next to you. It's incredibly competitive. And sometimes being the loudest, most controversial person is what makes you popular in New York. So I think sometimes. a lot of, yeah, I think a lot <laughs> yeah. of them in some ways are kind of playing up to that. Right. And I have found people that I have worked with, whether it be at my station or somewhere else, the way they're acting on TV isn't necessarily how they act. Yeah, see, that's weird. I don't when understand they're off. that, too. Yeah, yeah. I guess that, yeah, that's a TV thing. I don't understand yeah. that. Yeah, and part. it's really a this New York thing. This is exactly thing. how I am. This is why I'm this <laughs> schmuck 
all of the time. Okay, so we're going to do some uh, some questions. We do a thing okay. called a, uh, frivolous questions of dubious import. Okay, so the quicker I like it. Yes, exactly. It's a very some new story. vocab words. Have you personally ever tried any of the things that Michael Beasley was on during your interview <laughs> with him? <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I feel like I can't answer. The college days were crazy. I no. <laughs> I think we know. I'm not the only one who's breaking bombs in champagne. You know, it's so funny, though, because Michael Beasley was fantastic. And one of the things that happened in the interview was he wanted to change this narrative of people thinking that he is still some guy that smokes weed, right, as he right, was right, saying right. he doesn't smoke anymore and all this stuff. But right when that interview came up, that's what everyone said. Yeah. And it yeah, was almost yeah, like it, it yeah. backfired. Um, I, I mean, but, but I will say, he definitely comes across very appealing in that yes. interview. Like, I don't think there's it. Like, he, he does, frankly, come across as high, but he also <laughs> comes across as very appealing. Like, yeah. there's no, it's hard to, the, Beasley's kind of had to overcome some stuff, his For career, sure. some perceptions, and I think, Certainly, that was a positive interview. Yes, I and he's incredibly positive. introspective yes. and smart, so he, he was a good guest. I also think he's lying about the weed, but that's okay. That's all right. Uh, I love you, Michael. Uh, he's right <laughs> behind me. He's right back there. Uh, is there a strategy for interviewing someone that is more than seven feet tall? No. <laughs> Put your arm up. <laughs> yeah, up, wear yeah. heels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I am amazed when I see Tracy Wolfson interviewing because yeah, yeah, she's so right, much right, smaller, right, right. but it, it, it's like, it's, that's a part of it. Everyone's taller than you. <laughs> <clears throat> do you still watch sports when you're not on the clock? When you're not working, do you like just as a casual, not not because I'm researching this for the show tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Like, do you still watch it? Just can you still watch it in like the casual kind of enjoyable way? Yes, depends on the sport, but yes. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Well, so not curling. <laughs> yeah, like, let me tell you, I don't really like to watch baseball when I'm not at SNY. I'm not a baseball person. History is great. Unless it's the Cardinals. Right of course, of course. Yes. Of course. Okay, now you saved it with that one. Um, what quarterback do you watch that makes you, drives you the most nuts that he is in the NFL and Colin Kaepernick is not in the NFL? Ooh. Mine is Nathan Peterman. Nathan Peterman. So, yeah. he's, he's terrible and his name is Nathan Peterman. <laughs> like, no one. Well, one's... coming up, it's going to be RG3 because yeah, that is yeah, ridiculous yeah, that is to a, me. Yeah, yeah. Because most of the people that I'm like, are you serious you're in the NFL and Colin isn't are the ones that are backups, so you don't right. see them playing right. as much. Exactly. But it's ridiculous to me yeah. that RG3 We've seen, is he, not I think he's shown league. exactly what. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I need everyone on earth to just scream out, Colin Kaepernick is not in the NFL because he protested. Because at this point, it's, I mean, it's almost an insult to everyone's intelligence. I think they're almost doing it now. Like, yeah. Yeah, we're like this close to actually yeah. kind of doing it, though. That's, that's, that's nice. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, your father uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, uh, is uh, a, a former Illinois running back, mm -hmm. and I grew up watching him. Uh, I was young. I wasn't like, like 30. Yeah. Like, I was a kid. <laughs> okay. But I remember watching him. So does it bother your father? that you have a Wikipedia page and he doesn't. <laughs> no, my dad is probably so proud of that fact. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but he should have, like, Thomas yeah. Rook should have it. I remember one time he said someone asked like, oh, are you Taylor's dad? Yeah. You know, whereas <laughs> that when was I the first, first time, yeah, right, right, right. When I first got to school, everyone was like, wait, Rooks, is your dad Thomas Rooks? Yeah. Did he, you know? And that's so, how it's passed, oh. Yeah, he's, he's, gonna have he's to get loving used to that. this. I think yeah. he's gonna have to get used to that. <laughs> okay, um, last question on these. Okay. The Lovey Beard, the Lovey Lovey Smith, yeah, our, with our the football Santa Claus. Yeah, I think it is wonderful. Thank I think you. it's actually wonderful. I got in a, I got in a in a Twitter debate with Bamani Jones. He does not like the beard. He thinks the beard is a sign of loss. Like he's like That's been funny. in champagne for too long. I disagree. I love 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 the Lovey Beard. Yeah, I'm into it. Very I'm right there with you. Yeah, it adds some some character. Exactly. Some some gravitas. So yeah. Who actually played yeah, some Clooney? Fun. <laughs> okay, so uh, now it's time for a game. Okay. Maybe a game. Uh, it's f going off the fact that your father is Thomas Rooks, who, who maybe is not as famous to people in New York as he should be, but is certainly famous right here. I remember the old, <laughs> the old Illini helmet. I love the guy grabbed. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to do a game, game called, here are some pictures of some human beings. Okay. Let's see if you can figure out from which other human beings they once spawned. All right. So I'm going to give you a picture of, a fa of, a, of a, uh, the, the son or daughter of an athlete. And you're gonna tell me if you can tell me, you're gonna tell me who their parent is. Alrighty. Okay, you ready? I think. We'll see. Okay, here we go. Number one. Okay, that's um, Steph Curry's daughter. That is correct. Okay. <laughs> see, that was good. That wasn't yes. so hard. Okay, number two. That is LeBron's son, Bronny. That's correct. That is. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. I, I love the fact that he wants to play. He wants to stay in the NBA. Until yeah, that. just to play that together. Is, if anyone were looking that. that. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Number three. This is this. this well, is, that's. Oh, his his dad uh, played tennis. Yannick. Yannick. That is correct. Yannick Noah. <laughs> well done. You know, it's. Uh, I, I think. Uh, I don't know. I think the looks came from the mom. <laughs> uh, okay, number four.
this is where I don't get this one okay, right. Okay, this is an actress. This is Rooney Mara, the actress Rooney Mara. Oh, well, her... Are her parents John Mara and is she Kate Mara's sister? She's Kate Mara's sister. Okay, then yes, wow, John okay. Mara. This resolves a question that we were all having backstage. Who is more famous, Kate Mara or um, Rooney Mara? House of Cards. Okay, Kate well, Mara. Is that is for an Oscar. People <laughs> like Rooney Mara. Okay, I stand corrected. This is. Uh, it's also Art Rooney. Art Rooney is uh, her group. Okay. Okay, and then the last one. <clears throat> the last one. Here we go. Oh, Rooney. those are definitely your children. Yeah, well, <laughs> the cards gear. The cards gear, the cheeseburger. Yeah. This is the, the, they're obviously my children <laughs> because they're not going to become athletes because they just eat hey, cheeseburgers. Hey, they may. It happens like that sometimes. Uh, so I, well, I, I, you've obviously never seen me <laughs> try to do literally anything. I'm actually, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ha not be able to walk for a week just for having sitting here this long. Oh. I really thought something happened athlete. for a minute. Okay, last, <laughs> that's a good, all right, so last question, last question, we played a game at the end called, uh, based off Outburst, I don't know if played Outburst, it's yes. like Family Feud played quickly. Okay. I put like 10 seconds on the clock, and you give me, uh, uh, you can name off as many as you can. There's no wrong answers, like if I said, uh, the first 10 books of the Bible, and you would like name, it's not that hard, I oh, promise. That it's I definitely, definitely that don't hard. know. Definitely not that hard. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is basically, I'm going to give you 30 seconds on the clock, and just name as many of them as you can, as quickly as you can. Okay. Okay. Name a Nick. Name someone who has played a game for the Knicks this season. Tim Hardaway 30 Jr. 30 seconds on the clock. Tim Hardaway Go. Jr. Yes. Oh, keep going. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm Go sorry. Fast. Tim Go Hardaway, fast. Emmanuel Moutier. Yes. Um, Chris Porzingis. Yes. Um, Jarrett Jack. Yes. Um, why am I blinking? It's stress. <laughs> it's stressful, right? It's hard. Yes, I'm very stressed right now. Um, Jarrett Jack. Uh, Willie Hernan Gomez has yes. played this season. No, no, not this year, sorry. He played this year. Okay, I'll give it to you, sure. Yeah. Um, Jesus, why am I blinking on all he the New not, York no. Knicks? He, 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 he raised too early. This season or this year? This year, this year. Time! Sorry. <laughs> sorry. So no, you, Willie Hernan Gomez played this according season. According to basketball reference, no, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Just to oh, okay. It. I'm also going to give you Jesus, because I feel like Jesus... Plays in the hearts of many Knicks Literally, players. every New York Knick just slipped my mind. That's okay. That's okay. And well, now they're all coming to you. Michael Beasley. You didn't forget Michael Beasley. <laughs> yeah. You forgot Rod Baker. I don't know how Rod you Baker. actually have a... Uh... Well, he's not playing right now. Okay, I so that I, I was thinking like the game not... I just watched. Who yeah. was on the court? I'm a Knicks fan. The, the Knicks stuck with me for, for my time here. So I love the Knicks. But I, I actually watched them from Athens on the NBA League Pass. And it's... Oh, it's still gotcha. pretty sad. It's still pretty sad. Ron Bates. I think for the random names on this list, I forgot about Isaiah Hicks. Isaiah yes, Hicks. Yes, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, Luke Cornett. That's another one I lost about. Yes. yes. And Damian Dotson. Those are those are some fun ones. So those are the next. That's so, right. Taylor, I was terrible at outbursts. Uh, oh, that's all right. No, listen, that's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, you have a Wikipedia page. And your father does. I am going to go out and start a Wikipedia page for Thomas Rooks. Because, yeah, I love <laughs> Just him. so we can link just, to him. Just on, so we can link to page. it. And he can be like, why is this weird stalker man from Georgia putting up Wikipedia <laughs> pages with me? Taylor Rooks, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you I really for having me. I really much enjoyed our conversation. And uh, we find your, where, where's the best way for people to see, the, to have the Taylor Rooks experience? Well, it's very easy. My Twitter and Instagram are both just Taylor Rooks. So I feel like that's as easy as you can Make it in my podcast. It's Time Out with Taylor Rooks. You can get that on iTunes and SoundCloud. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your time. Michael Beasley was fine. By the way, just to be very clear, he wasn't. She wasn't. She, she denies it. Thank you, Taylor Rooks. Thank you for coming to Will, watching the Will Eat Show. We'll be back next week with more streaming entertainment.